It's a pleasure to introduce Robin today. Uh, Robin hails originally from Australia. I, I believe WA, wasn't it, Robin? Didn't you originally go? England, actually, but uh, yes, yeah, sure. via, via West Australia, for sure. Yeah, the best part of the world. It's the only place that my wife ever said she'd be willing to live besides <laughs> Vancouver. <laughs> So, so Robin got a bachelor's degree actually in English in West Australia. Then she went on to do a uh, bachelor's degree of science at Sydney Uni uh, and uh, came to UBC to do graduate work. Initially, she started working with uh, Tony Pitcher on ecosystem modeling of uh, areas in New South Wales. That didn't work out too well. So she went through a long process of changing supervisors and eventually ended up doing her doctoral degree on uh, productivity and trade-offs in, in involving information for data limited fisheries. She, uh, uh, she went to DFO and started uh, a postdoc and then went on staff at DFO at the Pacific Biological Station in 2009 and has been there ever since and has been a real leader in a whole series of uh, research areas over uh, involving stock assessment, uh, ecosystem modeling, and so on. And she's uh, she's going to talk to us today about an absolutely fascinating set of work that she's done on how fishermen uh, respond to uh, regulatory initiatives, trying to force them to be more selective about their fishing practices. Should be quite interesting. Robin, most welcome. Thank you very much, Carl. I'll just uh, go into presentation mode here. And if you don't mind, I'm going to turn off my camera while I speak. Uh, but yes, thank you very much, Carl, uh, for, the, uh, in, for the introduction. And uh, I believe I was at UBC when this seminar series first started. So mm -hmm. I'm really pleased to be giving a talk in this uh, series today uh, after so many years. Um, and uh, in the spirit, I guess, of, uh, of this series, uh, which I think was intended to uh, enable people to uh, present work that isn't always complete. Uh, so one of the case studies I'll be presenting is published, but the other one uh, is very much a work in progress with my colleague, uh, Katie Gale. Uh, and so, and this is a, quite a departure from the normal, um, normal type of work that I present, as Carl mentioned, uh, uh, mostly work on stock assessment and modeling around stock assessment and management strategy evaluation. Uh, and so this is much more of a big data wrangling exercise. Uh, and so uh, I haven't given this presentation before, so um, thank you for coming to listen. So I'd like to start with uh, some acknowledgements uh, of my co-authors, especially Katie Gale, uh, who I've been working with on the Troll case study, uh, and also the co-authors of uh, the published Halibut study, Ian Stewart uh, from the Halibut Commission, Paul Monaghan, Catherine Bannermartin, and Lisa Lacco, uh, and also um, a big group of colleagues who have advised, uh, who have advised us throughout this process, and especially a shout out to Dave Boys, he's a halibut fisherman, um, and it was really uh, some conversations we had when I had the chance to go fishing uh, on his halibut vessel in 2012 that sparked a lot of this work, um, and Dave will be making a cameo in, uh, in one of the pictures later. So um, I first want to uh, start by mentioning two very important trade-offs uh, in fisheries. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we heard from Sean Cox, who told us that he read uh, uh, Hilborn and Walter's book from cover to cover. Uh, and uh, I can't say that I did that, but uh, when I picked up this book to have a look at chapter two um, on the trade-offs in fisheries, um, you can see that uh, from all the tags in the corners and on the pages, I've given this book a pretty good go. Um, but uh, this is a uh, Carl's uh, follow-up Bible, I guess, uh, written with Steve Martell on fisheries ecology and management. Um, Trade-offs are ubiquitous in fisheries. They're critical to understanding how to manage fisheries. Uh, and there are two uh, really important uh, trade-offs which I'll be talking about today. First um, is the short-term versus the long-term value of the catch. So should we harvest now or harvest later and let the resource grow? Uh, and there are many rational reasons that fishers might be incentivized to take more now than leave fish in the water, which might be difficult for a layperson to understand uh, why you would uh, why you would take more fish now than you would um, you would get if you save them in the future for the future. 
Um, examples of reasons for taking fish now, the race for fish in Derby fisheries, if I don't catch them now, somebody else will. Uh, no guaranteed access to the future rewards of foregone catch. Um, and sometimes there's distrust in the decision making process. So uh, proposed solutions to these trade-offs, uh, they were listed in a paper by Ray Hilborn in 2000, which was cited in chapter two of uh, Carl and Steve's book. Uh, number one, establish property rights, uh, for example, individual transferable quotas uh, to deal with that race for fish. Um, establish incentives to fish sustainably, for example, enforced quotas and monitoring. So really uh, those are sometimes referred to as the carrot and the stick. Um, and establish science and decision-making processes that involve resource users. Um, and the examples that I'll be showing today, I think are really, um, example, the, the major management changes that I'll be discussing today uh, really use those um, guiding principles in development. <clears throat> A second important trade-off in fisheries is biological diversity versus productivity. Uh, Almost all fisheries catch multiple species that differ in their productivity. And if fishing practices are non-selective, um, even if we're optimally harvesting some species that are more productive, it can lead to overfishing of less productive or weak stocks, uh, as they're sometimes referred. And these might be different species or they might actually be different stocks of the same species, such as mixed salmon runs, for example. Um, and there, were, there have been a lot of papers on this topic. There's three examples below. Um, However, lowering quotas to protect weak stocks can lead to lost fishing opportunities of the more productive species, and sometimes uh, it can lead to the creation of choke species. An uh, example of a choke species is yellow eye rockfish uh, in the US uh, West Coast groundfish troll fishery. And I think in 2011, um, the quota for yellow eye rockfish dropped to about 0.6 of a ton, uh, and it had uh, huge impacts on the ability of the fleet to target its um, other species. So some of the solutions um, that have been proposed to the biological diversity trade-off, the productivity trade-off include gear modifications. We used to see a lot of work on uh, things like bycatch reduction devices. I uh, don't see so much of that now. Um, spatial or temporal closures are um, often cited as a solution for protecting species. Um, and then what I'll be talking about today is non-spatial solutions. Um, to this trade-off. And it turns out that some of these non-special solutions are actually the same uh, solutions as to the uh, harvest now versus harvest later trade-off. So um, when I was a student at UBC, uh, many of the students were uh, international students. Uh, not everybody knew what was um, happening in their backyard. So just to let you know, um, uh, what, what we call a ground fish in the Pacific. Uh, it's a collective term we use for flatfishes, rockfishes, cod-like fishes, shark skates, all manner of other finfish species that live uh, on or near the bottom of the ocean. And in BC, the commercial fisheries and uh, surveys encounter more than 100 ground fish species. Um, more than 30 of these are rockfish, an incredibly uh, diverse group of the Sebastes. Uh, which are very underrepresented in this, in this graphic. And one of the other things that I work on uh, is data limited stock assessment of how we provide advice for uh, all those hundreds of species that we don't have, or those species we don't have enough data for. Uh, the, um, the fishery itself is composed of seven sectors, halibut, sablefish, inshore rockfish, offshore rockfish, dogfish, lingcod, and trawl. Um, all the sectors catch multiple species. It's a truly multi-species fishery. Uh, and there's a huge diversity of vessels, types, sizes, and gear. For example, uh, in the bottom left corner, we have a very small vessel, the reef monger, uh, which was a live rockfish uh, vessel, which uh, would use hand jig gear. Uh, Borealis, which uh, is Dave's uh, longline, uh, Dave Boyce's longline uh, halibut vessel uh, and ranging up to a uh, really large uh, uh, freezer trawlers uh, such as the Osprey number one there. So the major management changes I'll be uh, telling you about uh, and then looking at the effects of uh, the first one um, in 1996 uh, individual transferable quotas and 100% at sea monitoring were introduced into the trawl fishery. Uh, in 2006, uh, all of the ground fish sectors were integrated under a single management plan and uh, electronic at sea monitoring was introduced onto vessels that were too small to carry observers. 
And then in 2012 uh, was the freezing of the troll footprint and the Habitat Conservation Collaborative collaboration agreement, um, which I will tell you about as well. Um, and the important part of all three of these major management changes were they were developed in collaboration and with the fishing industry. And in the third case, the freezing of the troll footprint and the HCEA, this was actually completely uh, initiated by the fishing industry and uh, environmental non-governmental organizations. And DFO really came along afterwards to um, help out with the data analysis and the implementation. So the question I'll be talking about today is have these management changes, which are all non-spatial, um, incentivized and led to more selective fishing practices? So uh, just to show you a map of the area I'm talking about, um, so we have a variety of non-spatial and spatial management measures. Uh, this map shows in red uh, the rockfish conservation areas. Um, in brown here, uh, these are uh, uh, coral and sponge, these, sorry, these are sponge reef closures. And then in blue, we have the frozen trawl footprint. And so this is an unusual um, spatial management approach in that the fleet stays inside the footprint instead of um, fishing outside the footprint. Um, so I'm not really going to be talking about the sponge reef closures or the uh, rockfish conservation areas in this talk, but I just want you to know that they're there and part of the uh, management plan. So to just give you a little bit more detail, uh, in 1996 and 97, the introduction of uh, ITQs and 100% at sea monitoring. Um, management plans uh, in the 80s and 90s had become increasingly complex um, as DFO introduced more and more restrictions, attempted to limit the catch and distribute catch and effort throughout the year uh, in response to overcapacity, uh, total allowable catch overages, and concerns about discarding and misreporting for numerous species. And then actually in 1995, DFO closed the trawl fishery for five months due to these issues. Um, Bruce Torres wrote an um, important uh, paper about this. Um, and so uh, in 1996, uh, the trawl fishery reopened with 100% at sea observer coverage with uh, live observers on the fishing vessels and 100% dockside monitoring. And then in 1997, uh, following a year of extensive consultation with the industry, processes, unions, and community reps, uh, individual transferable quotas were introduced. And for those that don't know, an individual transferable quota is um, it's a, an allowable catch for a particular species owned by a particular vessel, and they can be traded in real time among vessels <clears throat> so that, <clears throat> excuse me, you are only allowed to land species that you have quota for. And a quote from the Taurus paper uh, from industry, at times it appeared that the process would fail, but the potential economic disaster facing the entire industry pushed all parties to find a workable compromise. Okay, so the second um, major management change following this was 10 years later, and this was um, integration of all the ground fish sectors together in the introduction of, at, introduction of at sea electronic monitoring. So in, throughout the early the 1990s and the early 2000s, the seven ground fish sectors were all operating under separate management plans. And we can call this management silos because they weren't um, working together. Um, and there was just a very complex set of regulations on what could be caught, what could be landed and retained, which effectively in the end mandated each sector to discard the target species of other sectors. And uh, in the early 2000s, increasing concern about the unquantified discards and highly uncertain uh, fishing mortality, uh, especially for rockfish species. So in 2003, uh, there began a really extensive three-year consultation process to reform groundfish management and licensing, emphasizing the need for rockfish conservation with uh, five overarching uh, principles for rockfish con conservation. And if you're interested in this process, uh, Tammy Mawani, who used to be a groundfish manager, wrote her thesis about this at Royal Roads University, and Neil Davis, uh, when he was at UBC, also wrote a really um, interesting paper about this. Uh, Davis, uh, Neil is now um, the resource director um, at DFO. So the new management measures, um, in 2004, 2007, uh, 64 rockfish conservation areas were introduced. And uh, 
in 2006, all of the seven sectors of the BC groundfish fleet were integrated under a single management plan. And what this meant was that uh, individual transferable quotas were introduced for everybody um, in the fleet, and they could be traded among quota holders in all sectors of the fleet. So that means if you were with, there were some restrictions, but if you're um, a halibut vessel and you've caught too many uh, of a certain species of rockfish, you can buy quota uh, for that rockfish species from anybody else in the groundfish fleet, regardless of the sector. Uh, it came with full retention of all rockfish species, so no discarding of rockfish, um, and 100% electronic at sea and dockside monitoring. And a quote from uh, Neil's paper, there was a collective incentive to negotiate a management proposal because the alternative of DFO imposing management reforms was regarded as much less desirable. Uh, and the enabling tools uh, for these two uh, are individual transferable quotas at sea monitoring. I mentioned the carrot and the stick. So ITQs are designed to provide incentives for sustainable fishing. They establish property rights um, and to eliminate that race for fish. And 100% at sea monitoring means that they can be enforced. And so uh, I was lucky enough to go out with Dave Boys on his, um, on his boat and observe how this uh, process works. So here on the left here, you can see two little cameras on the boom. They're looking at the side of the vessel. So they are recording every fish that comes over the side of the vessel uh, in this video footage here in the second panel. Um, and a whole lot of other information is also collected uh, while the boat's fishing. Uh, there's a sensor on the drum which can sense which direction the line is going, whether it's going in or coming out. Um, and so we have this incredibly rich database on a set-by-set -set basis of the location, um, depth and duration of fishing, as well as all the species that are caught um, on a particular gear. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, if, um, if the skippers have to have quota for everything that they catch. So uh, if they catch too many of one species on, on a trip, uh, they can't actually go fishing again until they've covered off the um, covered off that quota for that species. So there's a strong incentive to stay within quotas for the species um, that they have. So it's kind of eliminated the idea of bycatch uh, for rockfish species in that uh, if you don't have quota for it, you can't, um, you can't catch it. Uh, finally, um, the freezing of the trawl footprint and the Habitat Conservation Collaborative Agreement. So uh, by the early 2000s, there was a growing criticism from environmental non NGOs um, of cold water coral and sponge impacts by the BC groundfish trawl fishery. And so independently of DFO, uh, the trawl industry engaged directly with the NGOs to design a new management plan. Uh, and in this paper, uh, there's a great paper about it by Scott Wallace um, and others who were uh, directly involved in the development of this management plan. Um, they described it as an internalization of externalities. Um, in the, when, the fishery, when the fishery was um, catching cold water coral and sponges, these were considered externalities to the fishery uh, in that they caused impact to the environment, but they didn't impact the fishery. But once uh, the growing uh, ENGO criticism arrived, arrived, arose and it, um, it actually caused a threat of the loss of their seafood certification and access to their markets, uh, these externalities were very quickly internalized and the trawl industry uh, uh, did something about it very quickly. Um, and so the new management measures involved uh, establishing trawl boundaries uh, or freezing the trawl footprint, which I showed you, um, a habitat conservation bycatch limit, which is just a fancy way of saying a, a bycatch limit on cold water coral and sponges. And this was a world first, as far as the authors were aware. Um, and also encounter protocols triggered by a catch greater than 20 kilograms. So if a vessel encounters more than 20 kilograms of coral, it has to uh, move away from the area um, there's enhanced uh, monitoring by the observers on the vessel um, and they have to inform everybody else in the fleet of the location. So those are the three management measures. Uh, and um, so I, now I'm going to walk through uh, what some of the uh, effects of those management measures have been in terms of in improving selectivity uh, in the fishery. So the first person to look at this was Trevor Branch uh, as part of his PhD at the University of Washington. So he and Ray Holborn uh, wrote this paper, uh, matching catches to quotas in a multi-species trawl fishery. Um, in 1997, following the um, 
1996 um, uh, trawl management changes, uh, there was a substantial reduction in rockfish quota. So this uh, shows you rockfish uh, catches for uh, rough eye, short raker, and yellow eye rockfish. Um, and Trevor and, um, and Ray Hilborn were able to show that vessels were able to adjust their catch to match the quota. And there was evidence for spatial avoidance of certain rockfish species, um, the three shown here. And uh, they, sh he, they showed that the mechanism this was for this was significantly lower utilization of fishing grounds where these species comprised greater than 1% of the catch. Uh, and, they, and they developed some really neat uh, tools uh, to do their analyses. And the first was um, a clustering approach to identify fishing grounds or fishing op opportunities that's independent of a grid. So in this grid here on the, on the right-hand side, normally when we see catch and uh, CPUE data uh, plotted on a map, uh, it's gridded up into cells. Um, but uh, there are some limitations of doing this. Um, if you think of each of one of these arrows as a troll toe, um, skippers uh, have become very adept at targeting certain species by uh, orienting their sets in a certain direction, and they tend to go back to the same uh, areas uh, to catch the species they want to catch. Um, if a grid resolution is too small, um, then we can have a situation where um, a, a toe crosses multiple grid cells. Whereas if it's too large, uh, say in this uh, D, E, and F box here, we can actually have multiple fishing grounds uh, uh, all clumped together into one grid. Um, and so uh, Trevor defined a fishing opportunity as a fine scale fishing ground with sets oriented in the same direction um, uh, using a clustering algorithm. So if you, uh, this little tree here illustrates um, a clustering of long line sets. So at the end of each branch of the tree is a set. So how you define a fishing ground is of course sensitive to where you decide to cut this tree. And so whether uh, all of these get clustered together or whether these get clustered together. Um, Anyway, it was a neat approach, but, um, and the second thing they did that was really neat was then they defined uh, the utilization ratio for these, uh, for these fishing opportunities. So they track, they were able to track uh, the relative proportion of sets in years after a management change relative to uh, the proportion of sets before the management change, uh, which was, they defined as a utilization ratio. Uh, which is a bounded ratio between negative one and one. So this little graph here, this little picture just illustrates clustering of sets. Uh, we can um, turn them into polygons for, um, for uh, presentation purposes. And so a utilization ratio of negative one would mean that, this, that before the management change, the area was fished, but after the management change, it was abandoned. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we would have a new uh, newly utilized fishing opportunities, which would mean that they were only fished in the years after the management change, and then a range of um, negative or positive utilization in between. So uh, I'll stick to these colors uh, throughout the rest of the presentation. So we have this idea of uh, very fine scale fishing grounds, and then we have this idea of whether uh, how those fishing grounds utilized before uh, versus after or after versus before the management change. So the first case study uh, will be uh, on yellow eye rockfish. I'm talking about the outside stock. So this is all the waters uh, except for the Strait of Georgia and the Strait of Juan de Fuca uh, in the BC Pacific halibut fishery. So just to have a brief look at the uh, fishery, uh, this, the, no, it's a very diverse fishery as uh, approximately 150 vessels operating in this fishery. Um, and that's remained fairly stable uh, since 2006 uh, when the data set began. Uh, but we've seen a decreasing number of sets on the water uh, over the years. And this is in large part due to uh, the fact that the halibut catch per unit effort has increased over this period. So they can catch their quota with fewer number of sets. So it's important to remember that uh, fishers choose to fish in certain locations or not fish in other locations for a multiplicity of reasons, not just avoidance of certain species. 
So between 2016 and 2019, there were large reductions in yellow eye rockfish quota following the 2014 assessment, uh, which Murdoch, I think you were the author of that assessment, uh, where yellow eye rockfish uh, was assessed to be in the critical zone. And so this was uh, followed by some very large uh, reductions in the quota in 2016, 17, 18, and 19. And uh, this is uh, impactful um, for the halibut fishery uh, for the reason that in the summer months uh, when the fish, most of the fishery uh, occurs, uh, yellow eye rockfish and Pacific halibut occupy the same depth range. Uh, so this is the number of sets uh, plotted against depth uh, with the blue bars uh, showing halibut in ca uh, catches and the yellow bars showing uh, yellow eye rockfish encounters. So, um, uh, so we can see from the, uh, the yellow eye and halibut catch per set um, that the fleet was able in large part to uh, greatly reduce its yellow eye rockfish catch while maintaining a fairly stable halibut catch. So our question was, how did they do this? Um, how did, and it seems that yellow eye rockfish didn't uh, strictly become a choke species in this fishery uh, because it didn't, um, they were still able to realize their halibut quota for the most part. So this is what you end up with when you do the clustering. So this is um, a map of uh, fishing opportunities in the halibut fleet between 2016, uh, sorry, between 2011 and 2019. I can show you this plot. Uh, it's compliant with the five vessel rule, which means that uh, each of these fishing opportunities, these little uh, fishing grounds here, has more than five vessels fishing in it. Um, and so the colors on the plot represent whether the each fishing ground was fished more or less uh, following uh, the reduction of yellow eye rockfish quota. Uh, and so you can see right away there's a lot of pink on the plot, which means that uh, these places were fished less following the reduction in rockfish quota. Um, but there are some um, some blue cells here as well. Uh, and those I think mostly represent uh, sable fish fishing grounds. There was another management change that occurred during this period where people could fish for halibut and sable fish on the same trip. So again, just a reminder that there are many reasons why a fleet uh, moves towards or away from an area. So we wanted to know how much of this um, reduced fishing uh, following uh, 2016 we could attribute to avoidance of yellow eye rockfish. So we did this by, um, um, by uh, defining uh, yellow eye rockfish high encounter areas, uh, which we defined using uh, all of the longline data uh, from all sectors, all longline sectors that encountered yellow eye rockfish between 2006 and 2017. Uh, and so these blue uh, bubbles here represent high encounter areas uh, which are defined as a cluster of sets with at least 20 square kilometers area and at least 18 yellow eye rockfish uh, per set, uh, which was um, the 18 came from looking at the distribution of yellow eye on halibut sets. And then for each fishing opportunity um, that you saw in the previous slide, uh, calculate the percentage of sets that start inside one of these high encounter areas and then relate the utilization ratio uh, of the fishing opportunity with whether or not it overlaps with one of these hotspots. And before I move on, uh, you should just notice if you, if you can remember what the previous slide looked like, that many of these high encounter areas are also uh, areas where the halibut uh, fleet was fishing. Uh, so very high overlap between these two species. So uh, just to summarize all of that in a box plot, um, these box plots represent uh, the utilization ratio of uh, fishing opportunity on the y-axis and the percentage of sets that started inside those high encounter areas on the y-axis. So here we have our, on, on the far left, we have, we call it a null hypothesis if you like. Uh, these are fishing opportunities with no sets inside those hotspots. And we see the full range of, um, the full range of utilization ratios. And then as we go along the boxes, uh, we have greater than 25%, greater than 50%, greater than 75%, and 100% of sets uh, inside those um, yellow eye hotspots. And you can see uh, a, a slight decrease in the mean. Uh, so the more fishing opportunity overlapped with a hotspot, uh, 
the lower its utilization ratio, the more likelihood that it moved away from those uh, hotspot areas. Um, we did a um, we did do a randomization test, and the differences in these means from the the outside versus the inside they are significant. Um, but uh, there is a large spread as well. But we do see some evidence uh, of avoidance of these high encounter areas uh, in this extremely diverse fishery. So to move on to the second uh, case study, um, cold water coral and sponges, uh, CWCS so for short, uh, in the trawl fishery uh, following 2012, when we had the Halibut Conservation Collaboration Agreement and freezing of the trawl footprint. Uh, so this fishery is, um, it's, it's less easy to, this is a truly multi-species fishery, uh, it's less easy to uh, know exactly what people are targeting. Um, different vessels have different portfolios of species they want to catch. Um, but we can just right off the bat see there's been um, a slight decline over the last um, a few years of fish, uh, of, of um, ground fish catch. But um, in general, the, the catch is mainly made up of rockfish here in green and uh, flatfish here in blue, uh, with some cods and uh, ling cods and other species. Um, and this is uh, filtered for the top 20 groundfish species. Uh, the pattern doesn't change very much when you add the other species, um, but it just makes the legend impossible to read. And breaking that down into rockfish and flatfish, so we have a wide diversity of rockfish species being caught as well, and mainly being driven by canary um, rockfish, uh, I'm sorry, Pacific Ocean perch and um, yellowtail rockfish. And then flatfish uh, is almost completely dominated by these pale blue bars here uh, in recent years. And this is our tooth flounder. Uh, and um, the fishery uh, following uh, 2011, um, we saw the introduction of some new freezer trawlers into the fleet. Um, Aratooth flounder um, is a large predatory flatfish. Uh, it doesn't have very tasty flesh. And uh, one thing about Aratooth is that it has an enzyme in its flesh. And as soon as the fish dies, it starts to deteriorate. Um, and so it's very difficult to find markets for its flesh if it's landed fresh because it rots very quickly. Uh, these freezer trawlers uh, were able to rapidly freeze the uh, fish and uh, markets were found in Asia. Um, and so we saw, we've seen a huge increase in the catches of Aratooth flounder um, over the recent years. So uh, that's, the, that's the ground fish trawl fishery. Um, Cold water corals and sponges, uh, we know that they're ecologically sensitive. We know that they're ecologically very important. Uh, they uh, form habitat uh, for many species. Um, the ROV pictures that we see of them uh, very often have rockfish and other species uh, surrounding them. Um, and uh, between 1996 and 2006, there were 335 tons of coral and sponge caught as bycatch in the BC trawl fishery, which precipitated those concerns from uh, NGOs that I talked about earlier. So this is just a look at uh, the changes in magnitude of cold water coral and sponge catches uh, since 1996. So you can see here in 2000, 2001, we had a couple of years of really uh, huge catches of cold water coral and sponge. And then um, a continuous drop off since then. Um, and so really, uh, by the time we had the habitat conservation agreement and the freezing of the footprint here in 2012, uh, catches of cold water coral and sponge had already reduced greatly. Uh, and so this is our period of interest uh, between 2007 and 2019 and the next slides I'm going to show you. And so just to zoom in on what those cold water coral and sponge catches look like since 2007. So just keeping in mind, uh, we've got a shifting baseline here. Um, but um, here's, the, here's 2012, the Habitat Conservation Collaborative Agreement. Um, and this is uh, recent years since the agreement. So there's been a very large uh, decline in catches of reported catches of cold water coral and sponge and a reduction in encounter rates as well. Um, currently uh, in the fishery management plan, the objective for the current annual fleet wide limit is 884 kilograms, uh, made up of 562 kilograms of coral and 332 kilograms of sponge. So that's the TAC, if you like, across the fleet. Um, and you can see that in recent years, um, there hasn't been, uh, the, the 
fleet hasn't caught uh, close to that. So fortunately, hasn't uh, become a choke species yet. Um, so again, um, spatial response of the fleet. Uh, these are the fishing opportunities. Again, five vessel rule compliance, so you're not seeing everything. Um, and the first thing to notice, I guess, is that uh, all those fishing opportunities are inside the trawl footprint, uh, which isn't uh, very surprising since the uh, trawl footprint was designed uh, to encounter to capture most of the places where the fleet fishes. Again, we can see some um, lots of pink areas, which means that they've been fished less uh, since 2012. Um, and we can see some blue areas, especially here along the west coast of Vancouver Island, which means that they've fished, been fished a bit more. So the fleet has moved from these areas here in Queen Charlotte Sound, uh, perhaps into uh, other sort of more outside waters. Um, remembering again that this is not one vessel, this is multiple vessels with multiple um, objectives. And so uh, we're not just seeing one reason for uh, changes in distribution of the fleet. So we wanted to take uh, a similar approach to what we did for, um, for yellow eye rockfish and uh, define cold water coral and sponge hotspots. Um, and like for rockfish, there are multiple ways that you can do this. Uh, this is work by my colleague and co-author Katie Gale. Um, so she divided up the coast into 65 kilometer square hexagonal grid cells um, and then assigned a cold water coral and sponge catch from both the survey uh, and the fishery. Uh, into those cells. And then we define for this particular analysis I'm presenting today, a hotspot being uh, the top decile of those uh, areas. So these red areas, which have the top 10% of coral and cold water coral and sponge catch, we've defined as hotspots. Uh, and she used, um, she used the um, period 2007 to 2019 to define the hotspots. Uh, we do have hotspots based on the historical data as well. Um, but we decided to use the more recent period for defining the hotspots just because that's what we think the fleet is seeing at the moment. So here's that plot again, uh, the mean utilization ratio uh, of fishing opportunities versus the percentage of sets inside a coral, cold water coral and sponge hotspot. And this, in this case, um, when I say inside, I mean that some part of the toe overlapped with a hotspot. And so again, here on the left, uh, we have, um, the mean utilize the utilization ratio for fishing opportunities that had no overlap at all with cold water coral and sponge hotspots. Um, and again, we see uh, that uh, we have the full range of utilization ratios here. Uh, these three boxes have uh, some sets overlapping with the cold water coral and sponge hotspots that have a lower mean and generally uh, the range uh, of utilization uh, gets lower. Uh, as the um, encounter, the overlap with cold water coral sponge hotspots increases. And then finally, uh, very little utilization at all of uh, fishing opportunities, which have all of their sets inside, so all, of, all of their sets overlapping with a hotspot. So we see a much stronger response here than we saw uh, for the halibut fishery, and definitely some evidence for avoidance of cold water coral and sponge hotspots. Uh, we can look at this in a different way. Um, in this way, we've plotted the, the utilization category bins on the x-axis and the percentage of fishing of sets per fishing opportunity that overlap with hotspots on the y-axis. And so these three bars have a lower utilization since 2012, and these three bars have more utilization since 2012. And again, we see um, the fishing opportunities with the most overlap with cold water coral and sponge hotspots are in the two lowest utilization categories, which means that they've been fished, but they've either been abandoned in 22 cases, or they've been fished a lot less um, in 98 cases. Um, so again, that's some more evidence of uh, avoidance. Um, so just to look at what the reported cold water coral and sponge catch was inside those hotspots as a function of utilization ratio. Um, so on the each of these plots has the years 2007 to 2019 on the x-axis and then cold water coral and sponge catch uh, per fishing opportunity 
uh, on the uh, y-axis. And so the most encounters right now are happening in these positively utilized fishing opportunities. So these light blue fishing opportunities. So we saw a lot of those um, on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and we've looked and I can tell you most of what's coming out of those areas um, is rockfish, a uh, complex of rockfish species, uh, as well as uh, some flatfish species in Aratu flounder. Um, and then almost exclusively in these strongly positively utilized uh, fishing opportunities uh, where we see no reported uh, cold water coral and sponge catch, um, all of the catch coming out of these areas is arrowtooth flounder. Uh, so that has been a strong driver uh, pushing some vessels, this is the freezer vessels, um, pushing them into new areas to target arrowtooth flounder. But we don't see a lot of cold water coral and sponge reported out of those areas. So that was a very rapid fly through um, those uh, two analyses. Um, so in conclusion, there's some evidence for increased selectivity through spatial avoidance of potential choke species, um, either yellow eye rockfish or cold water coral and sponges. And in the halibut fishery, the fleet was able to maintain stable halibut catches while reducing catches of yellow eye rockfish. Um, implying a rapid spatial response to reduced yellow eye rockfish quotas. Um, and while the results, um, while we didn't see the entire fleet moving away from those areas, uh, we saw enough of a movement away for the fleet to be able to uh, reduce its catch of yellow eye rockfish. Um, in the trawl fishery, uh, there were stable groundfish catches um, and really dramatic reported decreases in cold water coral and sponge catch uh, and encounter rates since 2012. But uh, just the usual caveat, the results are sensitive to a number of assumptions, especially the choice of years that you use for the comparison. Uh, the cut point that was used in the clustering, uh, whether you have lots of small fishing opportunities or a few of big ones, uh, how we define hotspots, especially. Uh, we looked in the, in the Yellow Eye paper, which we published, we, we did uh, do a, a lot of sensitivity analysis and we dealt with a lot of those sensitivities. Results were fairly uh, robust to those assumptions, but we're still working through those uh, for the cold water coral and sponge case. So finally, um, yes, non-spatial management measures can have strong spatial outcomes. And um, a key ingredient in the workability of these management measures is that they were designed by and with the fishing industry. Uh, the utilization ratio, I think, captures the spatial and temporal effects in a, simple, in a single metric, and it really greatly simplifies the visualization of complex data. So what we've seen today is really just um, a simplified visualization of literally hundreds of thousands of fishing records. And so this really gave us a way to look at the data uh, in a way that we uh, couldn't uh, look at it before. Um, every modeling and statistics course I've ever done has uh, said, look at the data first before you do anything else. Uh, but the utilization ratio uh, provides a summary statistic that can be used in further analyses uh, to better understand spatial drivers of fishing effort uh, in response to management changes. And so we certainly want to do some, uh, some modeling work in the future that uh, uses utilization ratio as a, as, as a potential metric of uh, attractiveness to certain fishing grounds. Um, and just another caveat, we can't tell the degree to which the reduced cold water coral and sponge catch in hotspots was due to careful avoidance versus reduced abundance of cold water coral and sponge in general. It's possible that there are some of those hotspots that just don't have cold water coral and sponge in them anymore. Um, that can only be resolved with an ROV, um, a remote operated vehicle. And actually uh, Katie, my uh, colleague, uh, will be going out with an ROV uh, to look at some other things, but the, if they find themselves in some of those areas, they will be opportunistically dropping the cameras down to have a look and see what's on the bottom there. Um, and further analyses of uh, species composition in these areas. There's a, we have a huge amount of information. Now we've identified the fishing opportunities. They have a really large number of metrics associated with them. So we're looking forward to digging into those data um, a little more. Um, and with that, I will um, open it for questions and thank you very much for listening. Oh, Robin, excellent job there. I got to jump in and ask the first question. So your, your, your mentor and dear friend, Steve Martell is now making quite a comfortable living yes. by uh, real time 
they've got the Bering Sea fishermen providing real-time data on bycatches and real-time mapping of that that they transfer to the fleet by satellite imagery. So that they're getting continuous information, particularly about mobile species that are potentially choke species in the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska. Yep. Are you guys pursuing that kind of real-time information exchange and sharing information for BC, or are the BC fishermen starting to hire Steve and his uh, company to do that stuff? I I don't know the answer to that question. Um, we certainly. I'm not looking at the data uh, in real time. Uh, we have, there's probably a week to two week delay to us being able to access the data. So we could, and I'm not sure exactly what Steve's using, but I assume it's a machine learning of some kind. Is that right? Oh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's actually fairly simple. They, uh, yeah. the cooperating fishermen, which are virtually all of them now, because they're, mm -hmm. they found it to be a really profitable investment to pay Steve to do this. They basically provide their information on uh, uh, spatial information, lo set locations and bycatch on a daily basis mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And then they analyze it and send them back. Basically, they just send them back maps mm -hmm. of, uh, of where high catch rates occurred of, uh, yeah. of bycatch vision. Now even the fishermen, have, instead of trying to hide their own best fishing spots, they're actually sharing fishing spot information for target species because they're ending yeah. up better off than when they try to keep the information to themselves. It's really quite a remarkable thing. I'm surprised that it hasn't been recognized and caught on in BC as well. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing I think that in Alaska was certainly uh, initiated by the fishing industry uh, rather than by NOAA. Uh, and Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, I think when something like that is going to be of most interest here is with uh, mobile species. I'm thinking of uh, Boccaccio rockfish, for example, and that has the potential probably this year to start becoming a serious uh, choke species for the trawl fishery and other fisheries. Um, we saw a remarkably enormous uh, recruitment event uh, for Boccaccio rockfish a few years ago. Uh, and those, and, and as you know, um, Boccaccio rockfish was listed by Cozywick as uh, being in a critical zone and it has a rebuilding plan and quotas were dramatically uh, dropped for Boccaccio and then it had this absolutely massive recruitment <laughs> event that no one's no one's ever seen it you know a recruitment event of that magnitude before for um, a rockfish species and those fish are about to start settling to the bottom so yes something like that I think would be of really great interest to the troll fishery yeah uh, but for us, though, no, we haven't been looking uh, in real time at the data. And, and I think if there was a need uh, for that kind of analysis for management, I, I would hope that the uh, fishing industry would approach us. But yeah, I should I should get in touch with Steve and talk to him about that. I haven't talked to Steve for a little while. Hi, hi. It's Bruce. Uh, oh, hi, Bruce. Hi, Robin. Uh, I, I can just comment, uh, if, if you don't mind. We, we, um, the trawl industry is developing a similar system that uh, St Steve uses and it's called, they call it C-State, I think, uh, but we're developing our own. We have a, a, a pilot that's going to be run this uh, summer that's going to test it and it essentially it does the same thing that the C-State one does where it, we have our, through our electronic uh, monitoring systems and electronic logbook, uh, the ability for the vessels to provide real-time uh, catch and location information on a set basis and uh, going to try to be able to uh, share that with the with other vessels in the fleet uh, for avoidance purposes. That's great Bruce, I didn't know about that, thanks for that. And is that, um, is Boccaccio in mind for that? Uh, yes, for that, you're uh, right. Yeah. Um, Boccaccio, juvenile sablefish, salmon, and um, um, undersized wing card at a first kind of uh, species to look at. Great, I'd love to talk to you about that more. Well, I remember back in the 90s when we were sitting down with the trawl fishermen and mapping the first few years of the uh, the high resolution data coming in from the complete logbooks and so on. And we'd get them to try to sit at the computer and map out areas where they thought there would be bycatch issues and or a uh, bad bottom and things like that. And these guys would sit down and they just couldn't bring themselves to do it. They just couldn't bring themselves to share that knowledge. 
<laughs> it was quite interesting. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, question, other questions. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. So just a question on that, Murdoch here. Um, is that information to be shared to, let's say, across fleets, or would it be only within fleet, like within trawlers, or could it uh, that information be shared to Halibut and other sectors like uh, Longline and so on? It's confidential information, so the uh, participants, as they do in Alaska, uh, the vessel owners and skippers sign an agreement to only to share it amongst some those who have uh, signed on to be part of the program. And so in Alaska, there's there must be high high percentage, uh, let's say, signing on among fishermen because of the benefits. Do you expect the same uh, here in BC? Yes, there. It, uh, in the uh, Alaska one, I think everybody, I think there was only two or three boats that uh, didn't sign on and I think eventually they did. And yes, we, and once we prove it here in BC with a, a program that's one that's effective and affordable, uh, we expect it to be a high participation rate. One of the things we noticed, Robin, in the, in the early trawl data, there were these areas that seemed to have high densities of target species that they weren't going into. We asked them about that, whether it was foul bottom issues, and it turned out that a whole bunch of that area, especially on the west coast of the island, uh, was uh, dogfish infested, as they put mm -hmm. it, high dogfish densities. And the last thing a trawl fisherman wants for safety purposes and, and other things is to come up with a huge net full of dogfish. Did you? Take a look at that in uh, the dogfish avoidance as part of the explanation for the pattern you were saying. I didn't look at that, Carl, and that's interesting. Um, Bruce might be able to um, speak more about this because I haven't looked at dogfish in a while, but my understanding is that dogfish abundance has, uh, has gone down a lot in recent years. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that, Carl, that's interesting. Robin, I had a question about looking at the trade-offs uh, uh, for the halibut uh, fishery. Uh, you'd indicated, yes, there's a, a really close overlap in the spatial distributions of yellow whale rock fish and, and halibut. Um, and then you, you proceeded to show that, uh, oh, look, the catches of, of uh, yellow whale rock fish have declined um, and uh, the catches uh, of, of halibut have stayed relatively stable. Mm -hmm. um, but to what extent is that decline in yellow rockfish just a decline in abundance? Uh, that's one question. Another one is, um, are you actually looking at an appropriate metric to look at trade-offs? Because perhaps you shouldn't be looking at just the total catch, but maybe the catch mm -hmm. rate. Because if catch yeah. rate for halibut, like you could have the same catch, but there could be a lot more effort and that'd be a lot more costly. And uh, that that's an important component. To what extent are you actually forcing them to fish a lot more to catch the same catch? Yeah, that's a, those are good questions, Mara. Um, in terms of the yellow eye, um, the most recent uh, work um, on yellow eye rockfish uh, suggests that the abundance has gone up of yellow eye rockfish. Uh, it's actually not thought to be in the critical zone anymore. Uh, this is a work done with um, Sean Cox and his group. Um, and so, and actually we had a lot of anecdotal comment from the fleet uh, that uh, it was getting more difficult to avoid yellow eye rockfish. Uh, and yes, uh, a CPUE would be a better metric. Uh, over the last uh, over the last decade, I guess, the catch per unit effort of halibuts in general been uh, trending upwards, uh, uh, which uh, was leading, which uh, led that decline in um, number of sets on the water because it was like they were actually able to catch their halibut um in uh, with fewer sets um having said that yes i mean that was just a graph that i produced for this presentation um calculating cpue for halibut in particular is uh it's quite a challenging exercise just because uh long line data is a bit more difficult to calculate cpue uh the iphc does it with a fairly complex uh, statistical model um, and I just wanted to produce a quick graph today just to show that, you know, halibut, they've, the measure of whether or not they're able to keep catching halibut, I think, is a measure of whether they're able to catch their quota. And uh, we, didn't have, we don't have any evidence that they weren't able to catch their quota. Yeah, thanks, uh, Robin, on that. And 
Yeah. I, I wasn't too clear for the trawl fleet though, like uh, uh, you'd indicated that uh, there's been a movement to catching more of those uh, uh, flounders. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but you didn't show like, again, like uh, the extent to which catches uh, had changed, like if there's choke species versus, uh, uh, yeah, okay, the coral, that's what you're trying to avoid. But um, in terms of other quota species, I know with the trawl fleet, there's a, a really large range of species caught. Um, and so it's kind of difficult to make comparisons before and after, but again, catch rates, um, and it's really hard, ideally you'd like to, to have some statements about profitability before and after that, but, uh, in terms of the number of areas, like uh, like that's another thing, like percentage of area where you know they, they would be avoiding, uh, that that would be useful to know about, mm -hmm. um, you know, before versus after, because just looking at uh, the, those metrics that you showed, it doesn't really look look. It just gives an indication of, you know, where 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 there's they were catching a lot before. Um, yeah, they're they're moving away. You know, that's pretty clear. But uh, in terms of you know, the the extent of inconvenience, like there there should be some better metrics of inconvenience caused. Yeah. Uh, by these measures. Yeah. Well, I mean, the next stage is to take this to the industry and talk to them about it. Um, this uh, this graph here is showing um, rockfish catch uh, by our utilization category inside the cold water coral and sponge hotspots, for example. So we can see that um, in areas where they're avoiding, uh, there's definitely or they're fishing a bit less. There's definitely a different species composition uh, to species where they're fishing more. Um, at the moment, I don't have the economics information to hand, although um, there is a, we do want to work with the economics people at DFO uh, to look at uh, things like uh, value of the catch in various places. So we're just at the beginning of this particular project. Um, and, you know, we do have a vast amount of uh, data to look at. And so it's really a matter of defining what the most interesting questions are in terms of other uh, attractors or, um, or places to be avoided. And, and, you know, this is the same question that we have with MPA, uh, for, with MPAs, for example, is that when you push a fleet out of certain areas, where do you push them into? And what are the new, um, what, what are new potential impacts that you might not have had before by moving the fleet into different areas? So yes, those are really interesting questions. Thanks, Shirley. There must be a few other questions. We played a game with the early trawl data uh, when we were analyzing that spatial data. And we'd close areas and shift the effort and then use the historical observed catch rates of everything else uh, in in the full reporting to say what was happen what would happen to uh, when you close areas to the mortality rates of other species. And it was pretty scary. There's yeah. a lot of things you can do that actually make things much worse than uh, then you, you, you try to solve one problem, you end up creating five new ones. Yeah. I think yeah, it's much exactly. simpler to use this this approach that you're doing, uh, Bruce's approach, basically, yeah. to uh, let fishermen figure out how to do how to balance these things. Exactly. Yeah. Robin, you must be aware that uh, there are quite a few Canadian fisheries academics who have it in mind to put up a proposal for there to be a ban, blanket ban on trolling um, in Canadian waters. Um, and I guess a few of us shudder at that, but uh, um, I see Bruce is there, uh, but what would be your sort of response to that? Because it, it appears here that there's there's a lot of capability to avoid, let's say, um, avoiding, yeah, there's a lot of capability to avoid conservation issues, a lot of flexibility in the trawl fleet. Uh, um, mm -hmm. And and it's, it's it's you know as far as I know, it's uh, Canada's sort of uh, largest fish producer and maybe the most profitable one as well. Um, so what would be your response to those academics who are proposing a blanket ban on bottom trawling on Canadian waters? Well, before I read chapter two of Carl's book, I read chapter one, <laughs> which said that uh, fishery scientists uh, shouldn't get involved in uh, what should happen in fisheries. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it's not my role to get involved in those kinds of conversations. Um, I can just present, uh, you know, the results of what the fleet's currently doing. Uh, but yeah, I really have no opinion on whether uh, trawling should be occurring. 
you know, the maps you showed give the obvious answer to that whole question, Robin, <laughs> is that even at the best of times without any restrictions, they were only trawl, able to trawl a very small percentage of the bottom where their efforts had always been concentrated. There's too many areas with great big glacial erratic boulders and all manner of other impediments to fishing that yeah. uh, essentially close most of the ocean bottom to trawling out there. It's yeah. crazy to shut down the fishery be, that's have, even at the worst a relatively small percentage impact on the on the on the benthic ecosystem out there. Yeah. What uh, uh, what Robin didn't uh, go into detail about the habitat conservation agreement, it, uh, understandably, was that uh, that agreement uh, with the environmental community and the industry. Uh, that the department has put into place in the uh, fisheries management plan, it uh, protects 50% of uh, of the uh, all the different substrate types by depth strata going from uh, zero uh, every 200 meters out to uh, uh, 1600 meters. So the protection of all the different habitat types, et cetera, is uh, is part of that agreement. Thanks, Bruce. Are there any other questions, comments? Yeah, thanks very much, Bruce, for your comments. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. <laughs> yep. All right, so it looks like uh, there aren't any other questions or comments. So thanks uh, very much, Robin, for incredibly informative and destructive talk. Um, really interesting, great for us to academics to understand what's uh, going on on the ground out there and uh, be informed of all the recent innovations in management. So thanks very much for your presentation and uh, look forward to hearing more from you on your stuff. <laughs>